and amen. Lord, thank you. Thank you for the word today. Thank you that it's being sown on good ground, good hearts, receptive ground that it will produce 100, some, some 100 fold, some 30, some 60 fold return. But I declare a great return and the people that receive this word, they will walk in the abundant life. In Jesus name. Amen, amen, amen. All right, we started a series several, several weeks ago called Success God's Way. We've looked at several different avenues, several different ways, looking at several different things. Now we're looking at tithing and giving and understanding that. And today I want to talk to you about something that I've really never dealt deeply into and I want to take today and talk about the grace of giving. Grace of giving. I don't know if you're like me, but uh, I was taught about tithing and giving under the law. They'd always use Malachi chapter 3, and they kind of used it in the wrong context. Malachi chapter 3, and where it talks about if you, uh, that you've robbed God. And these are truths, but they've been twisted to put us under the law. Um, the whole chapter, if you read it, the context is is a New Testament context, but, but many people teach tithing and giving under the law, and you know it if you've, if you've hung out with me any amount of time. You know that we are now under grace. We are not under the curse of the law. We've been redeemed from the curse of the law by Jesus Christ, but tithing and giving is a legitimate principle and legitimate truth. That's in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Jesus talked about it, and it is, it is before the tithing and giving was a principle that was in existence before the law ever came. When, when Abraham brought his tithe to Melchizedek, there was no law yet. It was hundreds of years before the law. So it is a truth, but we need to understand the grace of it. How to, many, many believers have given, have tithed, but they've never received the abundant life that God has in store for them because they've misunderstood it. It hasn't been properly applied. And so I want to break that down today. So if you've got your Bible, turn it open. Turn it open to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We looked at this briefly last week, and let's take another look at it. This is where we'll open. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. These two chapters, chapter 8 and chapter 9, contain so many truths. In fact, you'll get the, the whole, both whole chapters are all about giving. Let's just read the first nine verses, and uh, I want, you, want to show you just where it says grace. Circle the word or highlight that passage. Here we are in verse 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. And now, brothers and sisters, Paul writes, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Three churches were in here. You can read about that in Acts that he was specifically talk about, but he talks about the grace that God has shown them. In the midst, highlight that passage and circle the word grace. Look in verse two, and in the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. That doesn't sound like it goes together, does it? In the midst of their severe trial, going through going through difficulty their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity they were hurting but yet they still had overwhelming joy they were dealing with some extreme poverty but it welled up into rich generosity how could they give when they seemingly had nothing let's look on go on because of grace Verse 3, for I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. That's what grace is, beyond your own ability. Entirely on their own. In other words, he says, I didn't have to twist them and, and compel them and push them. They wanted to do it. Look, Verse 4, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. They were pleading with us with Paul, can we please give? Let us be a part of this offering. Can we please help? Can we please serve? They tapped into this grace, this unmerited favor. Watch this. Verse 5, the, and they exceeded our expectations. They Look what they did first. They gave themselves, first of all, to the Lord. Here's where grace really begins. It begins with us recognizing that God has already given us everything. Therefore, we can trust him with our whole entire lives. And that's what they did. They gave themselves, first of all, to the Lord, and then by the will of God, also to us. They said, 
Paul's saying they, because they understood this grace of God, how much God had given them, they understood that they were willing to give their all for it. And they gave themselves, then they gave their gifts. Watch this. So we urge Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this, watch this, this act of grace on your part. Highlight that right there. Circle the word grace. Highlight that. This act of grace on your part. They appropriated this grace that God has given. I'm going to explain all this, but let's just read this. Verse six. So they. So we, uh, verse seven. But since you excel in everything, he's saying you excel in everything in faith. Your faith is growing in speech. You're learning how to talk right. In knowledge, you're understanding the importance of knowledge and knowing right. Right knowing. In complete earnestness and in the and in the love we have kindled in you, the love of God. You get these truths, these principles, these laws that they were un, they were operating in. Look at this last part. See that you also excel in this grace of giving. Highlight that. Of course, I'm reading in the NIV. Is similar in the New King James. But see that you excel in this grace of giving and that's the title of today's message grace of giving how do we excel in that look at the next verse i am not commanding you but i want you to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others he's saying i'm not commanding you to do this but i i want you to go ahead and complete this grace that you've started in they started collecting this offering for these needy believers uh, and he's telling the church of Corinth about it. Uh, Achaia, uh, I can't remember right off the top. There were three, three different churches that were there, and they were gathering an offering for them. And, and so he's saying, go ahead and finish it up, collect it all together, and, I'll come, and we'll come together and collect it and bring it to them. He says, look at verse 9. This is what I want you to see. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. I love this passage. Highlight that. That's a great passage to set to memory because this is how grace works. Grace is this. God supplies everything by his grace. You, You get it? He provided righteousness for us by becoming sin. It's a great exchange. He provided abundance for us by becoming poor he became poor so we could have this be be rich this passage says we know that he became sick he was beaten he was he he received our sickness our sin so we could receive his health and his righteousness it's a great exchange and that's what he calls grace here for you know this grace and that's where this begins we've got to understand and know the grace of God so we can appropriate it Look over in 2 Corinthians. Just flip over to the next chapter, chapter 9 and verse 7. I'm just going to look at one verse we, we focused on this last week. But watch this, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7. I'm going to read in the Amplified. It says, let each one give as he's made up his own mind and purposed in his heart, not reluctantly or sorrowfully or under compulsion. In other words, somebody's twisting your arm. For God loves, he takes pleasure in, prizes above other things, and is unwilling to abandon or to do without a cheerful, joyous, prompt to do it, giver whose, look at this, whose heart is in his giving. Whose heart is in his giving. This is a very powerful passage because I believe many believers are missing out on the return, on the benefit, on the joy of true giving because they're giving under the law and don't, and don't understand the grace in giving. How does it actually work? Many have taught giving under the law and, 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 it's, and have been confused by it. And it's preacher's fault. You know, you get what I'm saying? In other words, they're taught... When I give, then God will release his abundance. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together. And they think, well, I've got to do something first for God to give. And actually, that's not how grace works. Those, how grace works is God has already provided it, but we must appropriate the grace by faith. And faith always requires an action. Faith always requires an action. Grace is what God has provided in and of himself. 
Faith is how we lay hold of that. For by grace have you been saved through faith. It's faith how we appropriate. That's Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. God, by grace, has provided salvation, but we appropriate it by, our, by faith. Amen. We have to have that faith. And of course, the faith is a gift of God, too. That comes from the word of God. But look over in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 3, Amplified Bible, again. Uh, remember what we read in that last passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, the heart of a giver. His heart is in his giving. He believes it. This is a matter of revelation. I did a whole message a few weeks ago called heart transplant, and this is what I'm talking about. If you don't understand these things, it's very hard to have a right heart for it. And many people can, you, you get what I'm saying, many people teach giving and you can get an unbeliever to give if you tell him he's going to be cursed you can get a whole bunch of people to give and many people do that but you don't receive benefit from that the preacher may or whoever's on the receiving end but the truth of the matter is god wants you to receive benefit in your giving given it shall be given unto you there's so many passages that talk about sowing and reaping and and sowing and harvesting there should be a harvest attached to it now that isn't the primary reason we do it that isn't the primary reason that we do it. I'm going to talk about the primary reason that we give is so that we understand that God is our source. Again, I taught a message several weeks ago, and I encourage you to go onto our app and onto our website so you can see this. But stewardship, nothing is ours. We're, not, we're owners of nothing but managers of everything. We're the stewards, and I taught a message about stewardship. Amen. But having this right heart. Look here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3. Amplified, it says, Paul writes, he says, Therefore I want you to understand that no one speaking under the power of the influ and influence of the Holy Spirit of God can ever say... Actually, I did this, made this mistake again. It's chapter 13. I'm sorry. Chapter 13 and verse 3. I'll turn to it if y'all can't back there. No problem. And that's not your mistake. That is mine. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 13 the love chapter praise the lord first corinthians chapter 13 and verse 3 let me try that again therefore where is it i'm going to just read it he says uh and though i bestow all my good here let me read in the amplified even though i dole out all that i have to the poor in providing oh thank y'all back there even though i dole out all that i have to the poor in providing he says so i give everything away Food, and if I surrender my body to be burned in order that I may glory. Listen to what he's saying here. He says, it's not, just, it's not just the gift, it's the motive behind the gift. It's the heart behind the gift. He says, and give my body to be burned in order that I may glory. If I'm giving for my own benefit, for my own glory, look what he says. He says, but have not love God's love in me I gain nothing I negate the return on my gift yes I can be a blessing to them but God wants us to give with the right understanding and the right heart but that does come from revelation and that's what I want to give you today more revelation about this so all of us can receive the benefit in our giving in my notes, number two, look at this. The primary reason God set up the system of giving, seed time harvest, is so that we look to God as our source and not money or even our work. Not even our work. Because many people have said this, and many people, many believers believe this. You know what? I'm the one who goes to work on this job 40, 50 hours. I'm the one that went uh, and got that education. I'm the one that got the master's degree. I'm the one that got that PhD. I'm the one that got that graduate degree. I'm the one that's sweating from my brow. I'm working all this work. This is my money. I did it. And that is wrong. And I want to show you this from the scriptures. The reason that God has given in place is so that we look to him as our source and trust him. The moment, the, the second you put your eyes on you, your career, your stuff, I'm telling you, it's on the wrong thing. Your career is a resource. It's what God will use to bring it. But God will use whatever. If you learn to operate by the principles 
If you learn to operate by the principles, it doesn't matter what's going on out there. God will use ravens. He'll use a whale. He'll use dogs. He'll use anything to get you what's promised to bring you the hundredfold return when you're looking to him and not you, your job, your abilities. Are y'all with me? Come on, somebody. I just said a mouthful right there. Amen. Let's look at a few passages so we understand this. First of all, turn to Psalm chapter 50. Psalm chapter 50. We'll hit this one tomorrow in our, in our prayer and proverb in the morning. I hope you join me in the morning. It's, it's such a life-changing time. 30 minutes to change your life. Amen. And start your day going in the right direction. But here in Psalm chapter 50, watch what, uh, what uh, God says here. Look at verse 7. He, I'm reading from the Amplified Bible. He says, Hear, O my people, and I will speak, O Israel. I will testify to you and against you. I am God, your God. God says, look at here, I want to talk to you. Verse 8, I do not reprove you for your sacrifices. Your burnt offerings are continually before me. God's saying, listen, I'm not reproving you for your sacrifices and your offerings. He said, uh, I'm the one who put the system in place. God did. God is the one who put the system of bringing offerings and sacrifices in place. Of course, we're talking about under the old covenant. They had to bring these lambs. But the whole point was, the whole point, it was types and shadows. God was wanting them to see there was no power in the, in the blood of a, an actual lamb. What it all was doing was pointing to him and his blood, Jesus and his blood, before he got here. Everything, bringing offerings, was all to show that God was the one who gave us everything and we were to, bring, to honor him, keep him in mind, to bring back, to remind ourselves that God, you're the one that, you're the one that forgave me. You're the one that forgives me of my sin. You're the one that provides me everything I have. I bring the first to remember you. So watch what he says here. I will, he said, I will accept no bull from your house, nor he goat out of your folds. Verse 10, for every beast, look what he says, for every beast of the field is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills or upon the mountains where thousands are. He says, listen, you bring in me these goats and bullocks, I own them anyway. They're all mine anyway. I know you think they're yours, but they're mine anyway. Watch what he says. For every, uh, Back up to 10 for me just one more time so I can read it straight through, if you don't mind. Yeah, for every beast of the forest is mine and the cattle upon a thousand hills and upon the mountains where thousands are. 11. I know and am acquainted with all the birds of the mountains and the wild animals of the field are mine and are with me and in my mind. Next. Look at verse 12. I love this one. God says, if I were hungry, I would not tell you for the world and its fullness are mine. Do you get what he's saying? I don't need this from you. Stop acting like you're under an obligation to me. I don't need this from you. You need to bring it so you keep seeing me. The moment you get your eyes off of who is your source and put them on the stuff, when something happens to the stuff, and you've lost your relationship and trust in me, now I can't provide for you. Do you realize this? God needs us and our trust, our faith in him to provide for us. Are y'all listening to me? Amen. Verse, I love verse 12. Go to verse 13. He says, shall I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? I don't need that. It's to remind you that the blood is to cleanse. It's my blood that's going to cleanse you. Verse 13, shall I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Amen. Do y'all see that? God is saying, no, no, no. This is not for me. You're not doing this for me. You're doing this for you. <laughs> that's the point in those passages. Look over at Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 and 10 in the Amplified. In the Amplified. I love this because God is saying here, bring me your stuff to honor me. Watch what he says here. Verse, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 and 10, Amplified. He says, honor the Lord with your capital and sufficiency from righteous labors. Do right, do work. And with the first fruits of all your income. Every time you get a crop, every time you get a check, bring the first fruits of it, the tenth. Bring it to me. Look what he says. Honor the Lord with your capital and your substance from all your life. Honor. What is God saying? 
This is an honor to me. What you're doing is saying, God, I recognize that you're the one that gave it to me. You're everything I have, my strength, my strength to go on that work, my ability to think to hold down this job. This, do you realize this? Just one breath, one change in your brain could make you complete a complete imbecile where you couldn't work, you couldn't do anything. God is holding everything together and all he says is, honor me with that. Honor me. Honor me with it. Well, I do honor the... the no, you don't. This is how you honor him, by bringing the first of it. I know a lot of people say with their mouth, but they really don't. And I'm going to prove that to you in the scriptures and in an example. The way you really believe that God is your source and your supply is if you honor him. Well, pastor, if I had more, I would. No, you're saying you trust the money and need it more than you need him. If you really believe that he was your source, do you think God can't open doors somehow? He fed the children of Israel manna out of heaven because there was nothing out there for them to eat. Are you with me? God will do whatever he needs to do when we trust him. Are y'all with me? Look at verse 10. So shall your storage places be filled with plenty and your vats shall be overflowing with new wine. God says, if you will honor me and trust me. This is a heart issue that is, that is an act of faith, right? Heart issue and then my action is, Lord, I believe it. I'm not just giving lip service here. Remember Jesus said that? He said, you honor me with your mouth, but your heart is far from me. When, it, when we really believe this, we'll act upon it and say, Lord, I need you. I thank you. Without you, I can't do anything. And without you, I don't have anything. Are you with me? Many of you started out well, started out well, but then the same thing that happened to the children of Israel happened to you. Started out well, you were in desperate need, then God started picking you up and unfortunately, then you started letting your hands down and started saying, God, I'm doing pretty good now. I don't need your help anymore. And now you find yourself stuck, unemployed, broke, toe up, jacked up. Listen, we need the Lord. Let me, let me show you some more passages. Let me get back here. All right. Turn over in your Bible. Oh, this is what I want you to see right here. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 1 through 19. Let's go. Deuteronomy chapter 8. You remember this? God's bringing the children of Israel into the promised land. And what he keeps saying is, don't forget, don't forget. You've got to remember, it's me that's giving you the power to get wealth. It's me that's doing it. Let's read the passage. Beginning at verse 1, one chapter 8, 1 through 19. Watch this. Every commandment, every word, whenever you see in the Old Testament, commandment, just replace it with principle or truth, every word of God. Every commandment, every word of God, which I command you today, you must carefully be careful to observe that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers. And you shall, look at this, highlight this, circle this in your Bible, and you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and test you to know what was where, in your heart whether you would keep his word or not next so he humbled you and allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna which you did not know uh, nor did your fathers know he said listen I let you see what hunger looked like so you could see that I'm the one feeding you you thought it was you feeding you and that's why they kept saying well, man, we need to go back to, to, to Egypt God is saying, no, no, no. I can feed you in the middle of the wilderness. I can feed you in the middle of a pandemic. I can make sure you're blessed wherever you are, but you got to remember me. He said, so I humbled you, let you hunger, then I fed you miraculously. By the way, that is a miracle. That is the longest uh, recorded miracle right there with the children of Israel eating the manna from heaven. It lasted 40 years. He said, you did not know, or nor did your fathers know, why? That he might make you to know that man shall not live by food alone, by work alone, by his own ability alone, but by every word that proceeds, uh, every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. You remember that in John, uh, Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4, right? And Luke chapter 4 and verse 4, when Jesus was in the wilderness with the devil. Verse 4, your garments did not wear out on you? nor did your feet swell these 40 years. Can you imagine that? A pair of shoes lasting 40 years? 
Get it? There was no place for him to buy new clothes or anything. God said, I sustained you out there. I got, your shoes didn't wear out, and neither did your feet swell. Come on, somebody. That's miraculous. Verse 5. You should know in your heart that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord your God chastens you. He said, I'm correcting you. You're thinking wrong. Look at this. Verse 6. Therefore, you shall keep the word of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to fear him. We talked about that today in prayer and proverb. Next. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks, of water, of fountains and springs that flow out of valleys and hills. A land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates. A land of olive oil and honey. A land in which you will eat bread without scarcity. Notice that's a metaphor. He's talking about you're going to be in a land that you will have plenty and where you, I'm going to bring you to a place in life where you will lack nothing. A land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper, right? Verse 10, and when you have eaten and are far, full, not if, but when I'm going to bring you in because you're obeying me, you're keeping my word, you're looking to me, I'm going to bring you to a very, very blessed life. He says, but when you have eaten and are full, when you've got cars in your garage, they're paid for. When you've got a home here and a vacation home and it's paid for. When, you've got, when you're taking trips to Europe back and forth and, you're, and they're paid for. And, and you're blessed, your kids have graduated from college and it's paid for. When you are blessed, look what he says. When you have eaten and are full, then you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. Verse 11, next. Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his word anymore. Pastor, I ain't got no time for church. I can't, I can't sing anymore. I can't play any instruments anymore. I, I'm too blessed now. I got, a, I got a new house. I got a new car. I got a new man. I got a new woman. I, I, come on, Pastor, you kidding me? That's what he's talking about right there. I see that time and time and time and time again. Beware that you do not forget the, the Lord your God by keeping his word, his judgments, and his statutes, which I command you today. Next. Lest when you have eaten and are full and have built beautiful houses and dwell in them. Come on, somebody. Say vacation house right there. Y'all get what I'm saying? God is not opposed to that. And when your herds... That's your cars, your stock, your, your, your stuff. And your flocks multiply, and your silver and gold are multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied. Come on, somebody say increase. That's what that is. When your heart, look at this, when your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of broke, who brought you out of sick, who brought you out of the, out of, uh, out of, housing that is government housing who brought you out the apartment and put you in a house who paid for it and you forget where you came from is what he's saying and you forget how i brought you up he says brought you out of egypt from the house of bondage the bondage of broke the bondage of debt the bondage of sick the bondage of depressed who led you through this great and terrible wilderness come on anybody know what i'm talking about in which there were fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty land where there was no water who brought you water uh, brought you water for you out of a flinty rock out of the flinty rock next who fed you in the wilderness with manna which your fathers did not know that he might humble you and that he might test you to do uh, to do you good in the end good God then you say in my heart in your heart my power my education, my might, my degree, my cool, my good looks, my investments, my money, my, 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 my. When you start saying my, I don't have time for that anymore. Pastor, I ain't got no time for that. I ain't got no time. My, 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 my. Look what he says. Then you say in your heart, my power, my might of my hand have gained me this wealth. Look at verse 18. You know this one. And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power. What does that mean? Dynamics is the word right there. But he's saying, I'm the one who gave you the, the ability to get an education. I'm the one who's given you the strength to go on that job. I'm the one who gave you the wherewithal. Everything you have, I'm the one giving you the breath. I'm the one giving you the eyesight. I'm the one giving you every, the hearing. The, your right hand and your left hand work. Your legs work. I'm the one that gives you the power to get that wealth. And now all of a sudden you think you did it. Come on, somebody. Are y'all listening to me? He said that he might establish, 
Oh, then he tells us, and we'll preach this another day, but he says, that he might establish his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is this day. He says, the reason I've given you the power to get wealth is primarily because of a covenant that I've made with you, that you're blessed to be a blessing. Not just you, you're four, and no more bigger houses, seven bedrooms, 18 cars, blah, 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 blah. I got it all now. I don't need any more. No, he said, that's not what it's for. It's for a covenant, a covenant that others can hear this good news and they can come up to. You're blessed to be a blessing so that the covenant of the gospel of grace and peace can be preached. Well, I ain't got no time for that now. Are y'all listening to me? Look what he says is going to happen. Verse 19, and we're done with this. Then it shall be, if you by any means forget the Lord your God and follow other gods, other gods like your job, like money, like people. Your wife don't look good anymore now that you got so much money. Your husband, he's, he ain't smart as he used to be now that you paid, right? Come on, somebody. And serve them and worship them. I testify against you this day that you shall surely perish. He says it ends bad. Amen, amen. Now, how does grace work? Do you all get this? There's a purpose for the prosperity. We'll get to that in another, another week. But I want you to see it. What is the purpose? The whole purpose of this giving way is so that you don't forget. You don't forget. God wants you every time you get paid, every time you get promoted, God wants you to come to him and say thank you. Lord, it's because of you that I've got this. It's because of you that I live like this. It's because of you that I drive like this. It's because of you that I'm educated like this. It's because of you, Lord. It's not because of my might, my strength. It's because of you. Somebody type on there, let's not forget. Come on, somebody. This is good, good teaching. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Pastor Lee. You're welcome. Look over to, uh, at Romans chapter 4 because now... So God wants us to remember him. Now, let's understand this grace of giving. God has already provided it, but it is our faith that lays hold or appropriates it, our faith. Let's understand this. Look over at Romans chapter 4, verse 16 in the Amplified Bible because we're talking about grace in giving. Verse 16, Romans chapter 4, verse 16, Amplified Bible. Go ahead and turn there. Therefore, inheriting the promise. Which one? Any of them? Promises of salvation, promises of abundance, promises of peace, promises of joy, promises of healing, promises of debt freedom. Any of it, any promise is the outcome of faith and depends entirely on faith. Why? In order that it might be given as an act of grace, unmerited favor. Why is that? To make it stable, valid, and guaranteed to all the descendants. He says, I put receiving on an even playing field. I provided grace for everyone. Just because you look better, you're smarter, you're gifted in a certain area, doesn't give you an advantage over others by receiving by faith and grace. Grace is given to everybody. We appropriate it all the same way by trusting and believing in him, believing in God. So that, doesn't, that means you don't have an advantage over any other believer. Every believer, you may be more talented than me. You may look better than me, you get it? But I still get to walk out grace because it's received by faith. I appropriate it by faith. Not by my looks, not by my education, you get it? It's done by grace through faith, the vehicle of faith. And he says, that's so everybody can play a part in this. Come on, somebody. Just because you're IQ, you got a whole bunch of alphabet at your name, I can still live the blessed life that God has for me. Amen. And you too. Turn over to Romans chapter 5. Just flip over one chapter. Romans chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. I'm going to read this, I think, in the King James. Yes, yes, in the New King James. Now, grace is what God does. He provides everything. And I'm going to give you examples here. But faith is how we appropriate it. It's how we receive it. He provides it by grace. We appropriate it, lay hold of it by faith. I'll show you what I mean. Look at this. Here's the passage. In Romans chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, it says, Therefore, having been justified or made righteous by faith, Good news, we have peace with God. Know this, you've got peace with God. He's not mad at you. He's madly in love with you. 
because you're born again you've been you've received you've been justified or made righteous by faith you have peace God's not mad at you he's madly in love with you right there you get it we have peace with God how through our Lord Jesus Christ watch this through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand that's what I want you to see we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand we have access into the grace of God God's riches at Christ's expense somebody put that on the screen for me if you will right where you are on your computer grace this is just an easy way to remember what it is grace God's riches at Christ's expense God's riches at Christ's expense you we access God's riches at Christ's expense by faith right believing are you with me now let me give you examples and then we're closing turn over no let me say this one thing first that faith because you say pastor I have faith I have faith I believe God but I but I can't give her anything because uh, once I don't have any money but when I get some money pastor I've heard this a million times when I get some money pastor I'm gonna really bless you no you won't because whatever you have right now it's faith it's a faith matter if you ha- if whatever you have if you have a dollar you can sow a dime it doesn't matter what you have but I owe I owe this dollar to them is that all you owe it's not enough anyway right in other words if you take and you take and give them that you trust them more than you trust God are you with me now let me show you in the scripture so you can see what I'm saying here first of all faith without works is dead let me read this passage to you you're all familiar with this but many people say oh yes I believe that I believe that but no 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 if you believe it you it, there will be action corresponding with it there will be core when you believe something you'll do something if you believe the the building you're sitting here in right now was on fire it would cause you to take some action if you didn't believe it you just sit there right but if you really believe it faith always has action a- a- accompanying with it appropriate uh, action corresponding action with it always or it's dead the bible says here we are in james chapter 2 verse 14 through 20 let me just show you that what is a prophet my brother if someone says he has faith but does not have works or corresponding action can faith save him just believing alone no if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food look at the example he says and one of you says to them depart in peace be warmed you speak the word over him be warmed and filled but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body what does it profit him what does it profit verse 17 thus faith by itself if it does not have works or corresponding action is actually dead it's not real faith it's a it looks like faith but it's not real faith you can talk real big but if there's no action behind it you don't really believe it watch this verse 18 but someone will say you have faith and I have works show me your faith without your works and I'll show you my faith by my works he's saying here's how faith works it has faith when it's really alive has a corresponding action I can tell you're in faith by what you're doing are you with me if you're if you're not giving you don't have faith in what God promised if you are you do have faith in that all right now watch um verse 19 you believe that there is one God you do well even the demons believe and tremble do you get what he's saying believing in and of itself will have some action behind it if you believe there's a God if you really believe he's Lord it's going to cause you to get saved if you really believe he's a healer and he wants and he's already provided healing there's some things that you can do will do to appropriate that and that's what i want to talk about uh verse 20 uh but do you uh, but do you want to but do you want to know oh foolish man that faith without works is dead verse 26 for as the body without the spirit is dead so faith without corresponding action or works is dead when people just say I believe I believe but there's no corresponding action you can tell what they believe by what they're doing is what he's saying so watch let me give you some examples here for example if I 
and I don't have my wallet here, but if I pulled my wallet out and I gave you, I said, looky here, I'm going to give you, well, let's say this. You, uh, you give me $100, and I'm going to give you $10,000. $10,000. And if I, and if you knew I would do it, right? You give me $100, and I'll give you this $10,000. If you knew that, you would be a fool not to do it, wouldn't you? And even if you didn't have the 100 bucks, wouldn't it be worth it to hit somebody next to you and say, look at here, let me borrow 100 bucks. I'll give you 200 bucks back. If you knew I was going to give you the 10,000, it would be crazy not to get that 100 bucks somehow to get that 100-fold return, that $10,000. Isn't that right? I mean, b borrow whatever you got to do. Get it because even if you got it from your friend, you gave, and you say, look here, I'm going to give you back 200, right? So you give him back the 200. You still got $9,800 out of the 10,000. You can't lose. Jesus said, turn over in your Bible to Mark chapter 10, verse 29 and 30. Look what Jesus said. So he, Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one, that's the spiritual law, who has left houses, who's given up houses, brothers, sisters, father, mother, wife, children, or lands for my sake and, and the gospels, who shall not receive a hundredfold. Look at this. Now in this time, houses, brothers, so whatever you give up. He says, whatever you give up for my sake in the gospels, you're going to receive a hundredfold now in this time. Now you'll be persecuted with persecutions. And in the age to come, eternal life, he said, but right now in this age, you're going to receive a hundredfold return. Now listen, if you believe that, if you really believe that, you would be a fool not to do it. Come on, isn't that right? The only reason you wouldn't do it is if you don't believe it. If you don't believe it, you're not going to do it. You would rather take that hundred dollars and say, well, I need to do this, I need to do that. But are they going to give you 10? Well, pastor, I, do, I owe them that $100. Guess what? If I get that 10000 I can pay them off completely. But God, now, this ain't T-Bone we're talking about. This is Jesus. This ain't little Ray Ray and, and uh, little Peanut and them, Rockhead and them. This is God himself said, listen, there is no one who can give up anything for my sake in the Gospels who will not receive a hundredfold this time. Faith says, if I believe that, I'm going to go get that money and put it in there. Are y'all listening to me? But that's faith. I have to believe that. If I don't believe it, I'm not going to do it. You say, Pastor, well, when I get it, you don't believe it. Because if you really believed it, you got it. Come on, because we're all getting paid with something if you're working. Come on, somebody. Now, that's, that's part of the natural. Are y'all listening to me? All right, let's look at this. Let's look at how grace works. Look let, in salvation. Here's how grace works. God provides by grace. So God has sent Jesus to the cross, provided salvation for every human being. Look at John chapter 3 and verse 16. Here's how salvation works. For God so loved the world that he did what? He gave his only begotten son that whoever believes. So God's part was the giving his son. He already did that. Anybody who gets saved... Jesus isn't going back to the cross. God isn't giving up Jesus again. He already did that. It's a finished work. That's what we mean when we say finished work. He already did his part. That's grace. God gave his son Jesus. How do we appropriate that grace for salvation? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So in Romans chapter 10, we find out if you really believe in the Lord, you'll confess confess him as Lord and believe in your heart that he is that he, God raised him from the dead you confess him as Lord with, in, with your mouth believe it in your heart and salvation comes I have to act upon it God did it now I can my whole life go yeah yeah I believe that I believe that I believe there's a God yeah I believe that I believe that but if I don't confess with my mouth and believe in my heart and declare him as my Lord it doesn't matter what I believe. It takes some corresponding action. God isn't going to put Jesus back on the cross. All I did was appropriate what he'd already given. Let's look at it as it pertains to healing. Look in, uh, in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24. Look at this. 1 Peter, I'm going to read it out of the NIV. Verse 24. 
It says, he, Jesus, himself bore our sins in his body, all right, in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. Did you get that? He took on our sins 2,000 years ago before you and I ever got here. He already did that. He isn't going back to do that anymore. He's already provided that. What we did was receive him, appropriate that by faith, believing in him, confessing him as Lord. It, we stepped into what he had already provided, the grace that he already had provided. We appropriated by believing it. Watch this next part. By whose wounds you have been healed. Not going to be healed. Healing has already been provided by him hanging on the cross and taking the beating on his back. You don't have to ask Jesus to heal you all again. He's already done that. By whose stripes you were healed, it says in the New King James. You already were. When did, he, when did that happen? On Calvary's cross. Are you getting what I'm saying? He already provided. How do we appropriate that? We believe that. And watch this. The appropriate action, the corresponding action is, I say with my mouth, I believe I'm healed now. Now, there's other parts. I speak to my body. We'll get to that on Sunday series. I speak to my body, but I believe it. And then here's another action. I start doing something I couldn't do by faith. By faith, if I, couldn't, if I couldn't walk, I've got to try and get up and walk. I've got to start, if I couldn't move, maybe start with your toe. But you've got to have some work, some corresponding action mixed with your believing and mixed with your words that says, I do have it now. Not that I'm going to get it. I've got it now. I am saved right now. Are y'all with me? For finances, let's look at that. For abundance and provision. We read it already, uh, earlier, but let's take a look. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. Let's look at it again. It says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yes, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. All right. So again, we see this great exchange. Jesus took on our sins so we could have his righteousness and be saved. He, he was beaten and stripes put on him so we could have his healing. Here he became poor, who was rich, so we could have his wealth. Now, our act of faith is, according to the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, is we believe that and we take the first fruit of, of all of our income, our, our tithe and our giving, we take it and say, Lord, you've provided this for me and I sow it to you because you're my source. Are you with me? Now, if I don't believe it, I'm not going to do it. But if I do believe it, listen, you say, pastor, pastor, listen, let me show you in the scripture and we're going to close. Turn over to first Kings. I don't even have to, I don't even have to say it. Let the Bible say it. Turn to first Kings chapter 17. I'm going to read from verse one through 16. We're going to see a couple stories here of how this worked. Watch this. First Kings chapter 17. And we're closing. This is the last passages I'm going to read. And Elijah, the Tishbite, y'all know the prophet Elijah of the inhabitants of Gilead, Gilead said to Ahab, as the Lord God lives, of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. Oh, there's so much in here, but we have authority in the earth. He spoke and said, no more rain. And the word of the Lord came to him saying, verse two, get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook sheriff, which flows into the Jordan, and it will be that you shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. I'm not going to do it. I have already done it. Your provision is already there. Somebody should write that. My provision is already there. Now, God told him to go over there because that's where the provision is. That's an act of faith. He had to take action and go where God said go and do what God said do. If it is stopped there and said, well, you know what, God, you can send ravens right here. You can, do, you can do it right here. He would have stayed broke. Just like you, if you don't act on the word of God by faith, you will not, even though the provision is there, God has provision for you. He's not holding out on you. God's not mad at you because you blew it in the past. You did whatever, whatever. But we all have. We've all blown it. The moment you get on this and believe it, 
Come on, somebody. If it was me and I had $10,000 that I could give you for $100 you, and you believed me, you'd be a fool not to do that. We just have to be not believing and doubt not to trust God. That's all it is. But faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's why you're hearing. Look at this, verse 5. So he went and did. I love that. According to the word of the Lord. For he went and stayed by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning. They didn't just start when he came there. They were there doing it, and he showed up where it was because of his obedience. He obeyed what God said, and the provision was there. Are y'all listening to me? We have to ex respond. Grace is what God provides. Faith is our response to his provision, to his grace. My, my faith responds to, I know he's provided that. I know he's provided it. My, my faith is, here's my seed that proves it. I believe it, Lord. I believe it. I thank you for it. Amen. Verse 6, the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and the meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Look at this. Go. And it happened after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Verse 8, then the word of the Lord came to him saying, y'all, if you'll stay in the word, God's going to direct and lead you. He'll direct and lead you. Are y'all listening to me? Everything you need, God's got you. You've got to get in his word. Join me at prayer and proverb every day. I'm telling you, you're going to get it work. Watch this, verse 9. God says, arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. Not I'm going to. I've already told her to do it. Provision is waiting for you there. Get up and go. Now watch this. Now he's involving some other woman. This woman, now here's the story that we've got to see because God already told her, provide for him when he gets there. God tells Elijah, go there, I'm providing for you there. Come on, somebody, I hope you see this. Verse 10, so he arose and went to Zarephath. He's obedient. And when he came to the gate of the city, indeed a widow was there, just like God said, was there gathering sticks, and he called to her and said, please bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. And, as she, and don't forget, this is a drought, so water is a rarity now, right? That's a rare commodity. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. When you come back, bring me a biscuit with you. Come on, somebody. He could have caught a bullet or a shoe or something had that been some people today. Come on, somebody. I can't even believe the man of God asking me to give an offering as broke as I am. God told you already in his word, you need to sow to live. Watch this. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand next. 12. So she said, as the Lord your God lives. That's called attitude right there. That's called shade. I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. And see, I'm going and gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and for my son that we may eat it and we go and die. This is all we got right here. This is it. It's a famine. We broke. We ain't got nothing else. How dare you come and ask me for this? God told him, I already told her to, 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 to uh, provide for you. She ain't got nothing but a little meal in the, in the, in the bottom. You say, Pastor, I ain't even got enough to pay on my bills. Good. I bet you got seed, though. You've got to have discernment on what is your seed and what is bread. Look at this. Watch this. God doesn't want it all. He wants a seed, though. And Elijah said to her, do not fear. That's usually the problem. We're afraid. We're fearful, which is the, either we're in word faith or we're in fear. If we listen to the world and watch the economy, watch what everybody says, and don't hear what God says, you'll walk in fear. But if you hear what God says and keep hearing, you'll walk in faith and trust him and not, not the world systems, not the economy, not the politicians, not whatever it is they want to hand you out. You'll look to God. Come on, somebody. And Elijah said to her, do not fear. Go and do as you've said, but make me a small cake from it first and bring it to me pastor well you know uh pastor I, I i i i give i give i'll ask do you tithe well you know i can't i can't give a tenth but i would i get some extra wrong this bring look what it says here do as you said but make me a small cake from it first 
don't bring me the leftovers after you ate what you and your boy want. Bring me it first to show, show God that you honor me. You're looking to me. You get it? Many believers wait. They pay all their bills. They get everything. Pay all their car payments, all the, all the crazy stuff they went and got. And then have this little bit left. They got $5 left. And they say, well, here you go, God. Here's, here's, here's 50 cents off of that. No, no, no. God says, bring me the first of it. Bring me the first. When you get it, bring me the first tenth, right? Now, this is by faith. This is by faith. When you understand who he is, that he's your source, that he wants to make great provision for you, not under compulsion, but you need a revelation of this. Do you see that? I hope you all hear what I'm saying. He says, and afterward, make, uh, make uh, some for yourself and your son. Next. For thus the Lord uh, God of Israel, says the Lord God of Israel, the bin shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. It's not going to run out as long as you're looking to me. Verse 15, so she went and did according to the word of Elijah. Isn't that good news right there? She acted on the word. That's what faith is, acting on the word. And she and he and her household ate for many days. Verse 16. And the bin, the bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. Close your Bible. Do y'all receive that today? Listen, let me pray for you. Father, thank you. Thank you for this word, and thank you for those who are hearing. Lord, give us confidence from your word that you are not a man that you can lie. You can't lie to us. You can't lie. It's by your stripes that we're healed. You've already provided it. It's by the blood of Jesus that you've already provided salvation. It's by you becoming poor that we can be rich. You've already provided it. Now, Lord, we will act in faith with everything we have to honor you with our substance. And Lord, I thank you that you're opening the windows of heaven, pouring out blessings so great that we don't have room enough to receive because we trust in you. Not because we're trying to get out from under the curse, but because we understand this grace that you've already provided for us in Jesus' name. Friend, if you're watching today and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, can I assure you, God's not mad at you. He really is madly in love with you, and he has great things in store for you. If you want Jesus as your Lord and your personal Savior, as your healer, as your provider, he's all that. It starts with you just receiving him as Lord. I already went over the scriptures about it in, in, in Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. If you want Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he's already gone to the cross. He's already provided all the salvation. All it takes is your faith. If you believe that he's Lord, say this simple prayer. And Jesus is going to come into your heart. He's going to be your Lord. You're going to be saved forevermore. Say this, Father, in the name of Jesus, I believe that Jesus died and rose again from the dead just for me. You're my Lord, my Savior, my provider, my healer by grace. And right now, I take hold of it. I appropriate it by faith. I say with my mouth and believe in my heart that you're my Lord. I'm saved. I'm forgiven. In Jesus' name, amen. Friend, you said that simple prayer. We believe you got born again. Listen, I hope you understand this. If you didn't understand this, go back, watch it again. Go back and see all the messages we've taught thus far about sowing and giving. I'm telling you, God's got a life for you that's superior in quality and quantity. He's got a great life in store. Listen, I love you. I can't wait to see you right here next time. I can't wait to see you tomorrow morning at prayer in Proverbs 7 a.m. 